Welcome to the English edition of Around the Globe. Israel is in hot waters now. The Zionist entity is said to be investigated for war crimes in Palestine by International Criminal Court. The court has announced that there is sufficient evidence that the Jewish state has committed war crimes in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, all occupied in 1967. Now the chief prosecutor of the court, Fartu Ben Sauda, said that the court will formally start trial on the allegations. This is in spite of the strong objection raised by Israel that International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction in the occupied territories. But according to the international law, no occupier has jurisdiction in the territories invaded and taken over by them. And all these areas were originally part of the Kingdom of Jordan. In fact, the Israeli government is trying to escape the investigation using a specious legal rule. However, the prosecutor said that the objection by Israel will be referred to the court for a final decision. The Palestine Authority is a signatory to the International Criminal Court Covenant. Israel has strongly condemned the steps taken by ICC the preliminary investigation will be about the war crimes committed by Israel in 2014 attacks against the Gaza Strip, which left 2,251 Palestinians dead and 74 Israelis dead. All the Israelis were members of the Israeli army while the majority of the Palestinians killed were civilians. If everything goes well, the rebels in Darfur region, the restless region in the Sudan, will sign a peace deal with the central government. The hope has been fueled by the power sharing agreement signed in August between leaders of the democratic movements and the generals who are in power. After the fall of General Umar al-Bashir, the Sudanese president who was accused of executing genocide in Darfur. Sudan has been facing almost uninterrupted civil war since independence from Britain in 1956, forcing the central government to fight the secessionist movements in South Sudan, financed, armed, and abetted by the United States and Israel. General Bashir finally buckled under tremendous American pressure and granted independence to South Sudan, which is now a battleground for many armed tribes. Therefore, a relatively prosperous region in the country became restless under Bashir who used the militia called Janjaweed to crush the rebellion. However, he could not fully defeat the armed insurgents who were taking refuge in the neighboring countries like Chad. The current regime under General Abdul Fattah Burhan is more receptive to the rebels' demands. Abdul Wahid An-Nur, the leader of the most defiant of the insurgents, is expected to return to Khartoum from Paris to join the peace talks. More autonomy and more share in the regional income will help sort out the problems. However, one obstacle is looming large. Muhammad Hamdan al Dagala, who once controlled the Janjaweed and now a member of the military junta, may try to torpedo the talks. He is more anxious to topple Lieutenant General Burhan and become an autocrat in the style of General Umar al-Bashir. 
That's why he is not interested in having peace in the Darfur region. Now it is very clear that the American political leaders are angry with Modi government for passing a highly discriminatory amendment to the citizenship law. The external affairs minister S. J. Shankar, who is a seasoned diplomat, was compelled to cancel a meeting with the members of U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee. The reason, according to the Washington Post, is the presence of Congresswoman of Indian origin Pramila Jaipal in the committee. However, the real reason is said to be the strong protest seen in the American universities against a highly sectarian citizenship amendment passed by the Indian parliament and very hasty plans for NRC. Thousands of students have raised slogans against Modi regime. Even though US President Donald Trump is silent on the issue, many intellectuals as well as political leaders have strongly objected to the sectarian neo-fascist tendencies of the Modi government and basically to the Citizenship Amendment Act. Pramila J. Paul is well known for her criticism of Modi government. She came to limelight recently when she pointed out grave human rights violations in Jammu and Kashmir after the abrogation of Articles 370 and 35A, which were the fulcrum of Kashmir's accession to Indian Union. Pramila J. Paul was accused of sponsoring on December 8th bipartisan resolution criticizing the government of India's action in Kashmir. The fact is that in spite of the tremendous influence exercised by pro hindutva Indians in the United States, there is great groundswell against the high-handedness of Indian Home Minister Amit Shah and his anti-minority tirade. It is now, as once House members said, it is not Howdy Modi, but Adios Modi in the United States. Donald Trump, the tweeting US president, has become the third American president to be impeached by the House of Representatives. However, he may escape the indictment in the Senate, which is dominated by the Republicans, who accuse that most of the Democrats are leftists or even crypto communists. His abuses of power documented by the House includes a servile relationship with the Russian strongman Vladimir Putin. Donald Trump also raised false accusations that John Biden, his Democratic rival, used his influence to stop investigation into the alleged malpractices of Biden's son Hunter in the Ukraine. He was also accused of making a phone call to Ukraine president threatening him that the United States would withhold military aid to Ukraine unless it ordered an investigation to Hunter's business in that country. Around the Globe English Edition is signing off. Thank you very much for watching.